Ladies and gentlemen, this is a response to the How the World Works DDT and Malaria 101 video by Loser McCain is Through. I would assume this user is attempting to piggyback off the popularity of How the World Works by putting his name in the video title. I also have to give credit for this video to my friend Sorion, who posted a comment on my channel and inspired me to post this inspired me to post this response. He deserves credit for this. He gave me a few links. The rest come from my archives. Unlike McCain is through, we don't engage in Google research. This video purports to demonize DDT, despite the positive results of its fight against malaria and typhus, beginning in 1943. DDT was banned here in the United States in 1972. Let's look at the events surrounding the DDT ban here in the United States. A centerpiece of this ban was the EPA hearings in late 1971 and early 72. The hearings judge was Edmund Sweeney, appointed by EPA Administrator William Ruckelshaus. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. After months of hearings and receiving more than 9,000 pages of testimony from 150 scientists, Judge Sweeney recommended that DDT not be banned because of the benefits, the effectiveness in controlling many diseases. Then, without reading a page of the 9,000 pages of testimony or visiting the hearings once, Ruckelshaus overruled Judge Sweeney and decreed the DDT ban. None of this is surprising given that in May 22, 1971, in a May 22, 1971 speech before the Wisconsin Audubon Society, Ruckelshaus said the EPA procedures had been streamlined so that DDT could be banned. Ruckelshaus was also a member of and wrote fund le raising letters for the Environmental Defense Fund. While most of these pages have been lost or made otherwise unavailable for reasons known only to the folks at the EPA, however, some parts were retained by people such as Drs. J. Gordon Edwards and Thomas Jukes, who were among the few who fought for sanity and for the lives of millions against the ban. Also, the last 300 pages of Ecological Sanity by Kloss and Bolander is also a comprehensive analysis of the indefensible junk science which was used to support the ban. Also at the Steve Malloy website is a short summary of the DDT issues, which should be read by all. It's called 100 Things You Should Know About DDT. Again, the links will all be on the right side there again. You might as well forward to the five minute mark of McCain is through his cut and paste production. The first five minutes are just a litany of cut and paste courtesy of Wikipedia, WebMD, or some other online source. After that, she begins demonizing DDT. It appears, as my friend Sorion pointed out, McCain is through is stuck in a time warp. The World Health Organization gave DDT a clean bill of health and green-lighted its use once again back in 2006. It seems McCain is through isn't up on current events, yet that's supposedly the purpose of her channel. She sounds like Michigan Democrat John Conyers, who railed against DDT in 2007, long after the WHO had endorsed it. McCain is through point, McCain is through's point about some mosquitoes becoming resistant to DDT is true, but what she doesn't tell you is the extent of this resistance, nor does she even bother to cover how cases of malaria have plummeted in sub-Saharan areas after its use. Last year, faced with a body count that rivals AIDS as the leading killer in sub-Saharan Africa, the World Health Organization announced it was giving DDT a clean bill of health. This is 2006. DDT is safe for humans and remarkably effective when a small amount of DDT is sprayed in the indoor walls of houses and huts, it said. DDT presents no health risk when used properly indoors, Dr. Arada Kochi, director of the WHO's malaria program, told environmental groups at the National Press Club in Washington. Well-managed indoor spraying programs using DDT pose no harm to wildlife or humans. <gasps> South Africa used DDT to, flight, to fight malaria from 1946 to 1996 when it was replaced by other insecticides. What followed was one of the worst malaria epidemics in the country's history. Cases rose from around 6,000 in 1995 to more than 60,000 in 2000, and deaths went from the dozens to the hundreds. When South Africa reintroduced indoor, reintroduced indoor spraying in 2003, it saw its malaria rates plummet 80%. Because of DDT's effectiveness in disease control, the National Academy of Sciences in 1970 stated, to only a few chemicals does man owe as great a debt to DDT. 
In little more than two decades, DDT has prevented 500 million human deaths due to malaria that would have otherwise been inevitable. In July 2007, even National Geographic of all sources lamented that the DDT ban would cost millions of lives, and that it did. This idiot, McCain is through, singles out the Wall Street Journal for endorsing the use of DDT. The New York Times did the same thing in a December 23, 2002 article entitled, Fighting Malaria with DDT. Not much on current events, are you, little feller? Here's a word from Dr. Sam Zaramba, Director General of Health Services for the Republic of Uganda. Pay attention, kiddo. In July, or in 2006, Uganda worked with President George Bush's Malaria Initiative to train 350 spray operators, supervisors, and health officials. In August 2006, and again in February 2007, they sprayed the walls of 100,000 households in the southern Kabale district with the insecticide icon as part of a comprehensive program that includes bed nets, sanitation, education, act drugs, larvicides, and other insecticides, and rapidly improving patient care. Nearly everyone welcomed this protection, and the prevalence of malaria parasites plummeted. Today, just 3% of the local population is infected, down from 30%. The exercise pays for itself, with 90% fewer people requiring anti-malarial medication and other public health resources. More healthy adults are working and more children are attending school. We can make it even more cost-effective by switching from the current insecticide to DDT. It lasts longer, costs less, and has more modes of action against malaria carrying mosquitoes than ICON. Now let's close with this. There is a link between the spread of malaria and the spread of AIDS. Personally, if I had control of the purse strings, all the money we send to Africa would, to combat AIDS would be directed at combating malaria. Why? Because most people, unless it's via a blood transfusion or pregnancy, gets AIDS because of their own poor choices. For example, rampant homosexual activity, sharing drug needles, and multiple sex partners. If people would cease in those activities, AIDS, w AIDS cases would plummet. But people are ignorant, so we get to spend billions on ignorant people. Most people get malaria through no fault of their own. Now to the AIDS malaria link. University of Washington researchers who estimated the impact of overlap overlapping infections concluded that the interaction could be blamed for thousands of HIV infections and almost a million bouts of malaria over two decades in just one part of Kenya. <coughs> Excuse me. The research, published in a December 2006 edition of the journal Science, highlights the need for a joint attack on both epidemics. Malaria sickens up to half a, million, half a billion people annually and kills more than one million, mostly young children and mostly in Africa, which also bears the biggest HIV burden. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to 24.7 million HIV-infected people. About 2 million died this year, according to the latest UN update. Scientists have long suspected the two diseases fuel each other. The new study created a mathematical model, model to figure out just how they do. HIV is most easily spread when patients have high virus levels in their blood. A bout of malaria causes a temporary surge, a stunning seven-fold increase in those levels said lead researcher Laith Abu Radad, a scientist at the University of Washington. The surge may last six weeks to eight weeks. That is longer than it takes adults in intense malaria areas where people get the parasitic disease once or twice a year to recover from a typical bout and feel up to sexual activity again. He said, moreover, HIV patients are more susceptible to malaria reinfection because of their weakened immune systems. And we'll continue the rest of this in uh, part two. Uh, I won't be able to get to all this. And since if you're hearing this, YouTube likes to cut my videos short sometimes. So uh, I'm just going to fill up the rest of this space with nothing. And hopefully it'll...